Well, thank you for that very generous welcome. It's, uh, it's a delight to be back at Trinity and to see a number of uh, familiar and friendly faces uh, amongst you all. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great privilege for me to be here and have this opportunity to uh, speak to you all. This afternoon, I want to talk about panentheism. And I'm going to give you a, a, a version of a paper called Against Panentheism. At least that's the published title. The current title is Against Mirological Panentheism, but we'll explain that in due course. All the cool kids want to be panentheists. <coughs> or so it seems from a cursory reading of much contemporary theology, particularly, though by no means exclusively, the literature on science and religion. Yet panentheism is a doctrine that has proven very difficult to define and has generated a range of different responses in the literature. In this paper, I'm interested in what Philip Clayton calls Christian panentheism. Among the many different views that go under the name panentheism, there are versions that are clearly inconsistent with Christian theism, including naturalistic accounts. I shall have nothing to say about those views here. But there are versions of panentheism that have been held by Christian theologians, including orthodox and evangelical theologians like Jonathan Edwards, who I'll be speaking more about tomorrow. I'm interested in versions of panentheism that are consistent with broadly orthodox Christian theological commitments. To this end, in the first section of the paper, I'll set out the problem of demarcating panentheism in relation to theism on the one hand and pantheism on the other. I'll also provide one way of construing the doctrine that does, I think, reflect the way in which it's often understood in the theological literature. This is what I will call the mirological version of panentheism, which I'll explain in a moment. Then, in a second section, I'll give some account of the theological shape of the mirological version of panentheism, attempting to show how this might be thought to be consistent with a broadly orthodox Christian theology. Armed with a working definition of this version of the doctrine, I shall set out some serious theological problems with the doctrine in a third section, exploring why these render the doctrine unfit for theological purpose. And in a short concluding section, drawing the threads together, I turn to consider the theistic alternative to panentheism as a preferable way of uh, thinking about God's relation to the created order for the purposes of Christian systematic theology. So let's begin then with the problem of demarcating panentheism. There's a dispute about how to demarcate panentheism. As Ryan Mullins has put it in a recent essay on the topic, and I quote him, one of the most notorious difficulties for panentheism is its vagueness. It's incredibly difficult to pin down exactly what panentheism is and how it differs from rival models of God. Similarly, Gregory Peterson says this, panentheists must begin to look more closely at the N that holds the position together and distinguishes it from its rivals. Some scholars despair of giving any useful account of panentheism. So for example, Patrick Hutchins writes this, I cannot admit to being a panentheist unless there's something different from the other possibilities which can be specified as being a panentheist. I make my avowal of being a panentheist with a false geniality since I am, as I see it, committing myself to nothing. So there is on this way of thinking no, on, no clear, non-controversial way of demarcating panentheism from its near rivals in conceptions of God. So let's call this, the, this worry the demarcation problem. Not everyone is quite as pessimistic as Mullins or Hutchins are in their assessment of the prospects for demarcating panentheism. In his widely read theological survey of, of uh, the topic, John Cooper begins by giving a working definition of panentheism that he then makes the basis of a taxonomy of different versions of the doctrine. He writes this, in brief, panentheism affirms that although God and the world are ontologically distinct and God transcends the world, the world is in God ontologically. This working definition of the doctrine informs the rest of his study. On Cooper's reckoning, reckoning panentheism and theism share common roots in Plato and Neoplatonism, which is why they share certain features in common. Nevertheless, 
there is a crucial difference between them having to do with how God relates to the world, which reflect different strands of Platonism. These differences are expressed in two families of views that are panentheistic in nature, says Cooper. The first of these is Neoplatonism, which he says is panentheistic because everything exists within God in a series of concentric emanations. A second branch of panentheism, he says, equates God primarily with the world soul. On this view, God is a life force that generates other created life. However, some theologians like Augustine appropriate aspects of Neoplatonism without being panentheists. Hence, on Cooper's way of thinking, one cannot simply equate Christian Neoplatonism with panentheism. Yet, given this qualification about some Christian theological appropriations of Neoplatonism, Cooper writes that it is accurate to say that the history of panentheism is largely the history of Neoplatonism. That's what he says. Now, to be fair to Cooper, he does recognize that the diversity of views that claim to be panentheist, and in particular, the difficulty in pinning down how God is said to transcend the created order and what the being of God entails, makes his task, as he says, more complicated. That's almost a British understatement. But this he takes to be a problem that can be resolved by careful classification. Hence, he sets out five distinctions that he thinks help place particular versions of the doctrine within a taxonomy of different versions of the view. These are explicit and implicit pantheism, personal and non-personal pantheism, part whole and relational pan panentheism, voluntary and or natural panentheism, and classical, that is divine determinist, or modern, that is cooperative versions of panentheism. These are helpful distinctions as far as they go, but they do tend to obscure the fundamental demarcation problem by providing a kind of quasi-Aristotelian way of categorizing the different species of panentheism into particular theological genera, as if the real problem is just one of organizing the existing data according to sufficiently comprehensive schema. This, I think, is beguiling because it's not clear that key terms that are common or perhaps even essential in the literature on, on panentheism have a clear enough denotation for such categorization to be accurate. Cooper's survey of the history of the doctrine can only proceed if we accept that there's a clear enough working definition of the doctrine to begin with. But there's good reason to think that this is far from obvious. To see this, consider the words of Owen Thomas in an essay for the Oxford Handbook of Science and Religion. This is what he says, and I'm going to give you a little quotation. There are some serious problems in the understanding and interpretation of panentheism in what has become a fairly widespread movement that is gathered under this banner, he says. These problems arise from the fact that panentheism is not one particular view of the relationship of the divine to the world, to the universe, but rather a large and diverse family of views involving quite different interpretations of the key metaphorical assertion that the world is in God. This is indicated by the common locution among panentheists that the word, the world rather, is in some sense in God, and by the fact that few panentheists go on to specify clearly and in detail exactly what sense is intended. That's what Thomas says. The problem seems to be with the locution in, and the rather different ways in which the world is said to be in God by different thinkers who are supposed to be panentheists. Now, Cooper's aware of this problem, of course, but he doesn't appear to think it's a fundamental problem in the same way that Mullins, Hutchins, and Thomas, amongst others, do. Suppose we place panentheism as a middle way between the poles of classical theism on the one end and pantheism at the other end, which is a common enough kind of conceit, taxonomical conceit, conceit in the literature. The classical theist maintains that God and the world are distinct that God freely creates a world, that the world is contingent upon God's creative action, and that the world, uh, that God is independent of the world, that is, that is, he exists assay. For many the theists, it's also true to say that God is intimately involved in the sustenance of the world, without which creation would simply cease to exist. Classical theism 
offers a metaphysically richer picture of God's relation to the world than mere theism per se, including claims about God's perfection, his relation to time, and so on. But for present purposes, this characterization of what we might call bare theism will do to distinguish it from alternatives. At the other end, or on the other pole, so to speak, is pantheism. Now, as I understand it, pantheism, literally all is God, is the view according to which the world, that is the created order, compose the parts that make up God without remainder. Sometimes it's said that pantheism is the view that God and the creation are identical. However, that doesn't seem to me to be a very helpful way of putting the point, since I suppose there are pantheists who think that God is not identical to the world, strictly speaking. For just as the marble composes the statue, though it's distinct from it, think of the statue of David, for example, Michelangelo's David, so it may be that God is composed by the world, though he is distinct from it. According to Michael Briley, pantheism could include the notion that God is totally dependent on or coterminous with the cosmos. But to my way of thinking, being totally dependent on the creation isn't a sufficient condition for pantheism. Suppose the sum of all the proper parts of the cosmos compose God. Under these conditions, what would it mean to say that God is totally dependent on the cosmos? Perhaps it means no more than that God has the same dependency relation to the cosmos that, say, a table has to the parts that make it up. If one of the legs is suddenly annihilated, the table is no longer whole, and so one might think the continued existence of the table depends on the continued existence of all of its legs. Mutatis mutandis, God's continued existence depends on the parts of the cosmos not being annihilated. What about the notion of the cosmos of God being and, and God being coterminous in some sense? Well, that gets closer to my claim about the composition of the cosmos and God, but two things can be coincident without being identical. The statue is spatially coincident with the block of marble, but it's not identical with the marble. It has different persistence conditions, for one thing. I can efface the statue in an act of vandalism without thereby destroying the block of marble. You'll be delighted to know that I don't engage in such vandalism. <laughs> Perhaps the relation between God and the cosmos is like that, according to some versions of pantheism. Then God and the world are not identical, though they are coincident. Panentheism, so it's frequently said, falls somewhere between theism and pantheism. The world isn't identical to God on this way of thinking, nor is it the case that the world, the cosmos, comprises the parts that make up God without remainder. The world is not coincident with God either. Here the panentheist agrees with the theist that the world is distinct from God, yet unlike the theist, the panentheist claims that the world exists in God, which is the problem to which Owen Thomas introduced us earlier. How does the world exist in God, exactly. Well, of course, it's at this juncture that different analogues or metaphors are cited, depending on the version of panentheism under discussion. So this is appeal to metaphor. According to some panentheists, God is to the world as the soul is to the body. Yet this doesn't offer much by way of explanation of the God-world relation, which is what we're after. Similar things could be said about other analogues used by panentheists to this end. Recently, there have been several proposals that attempt to press beyond the appeal to metaphor in order to provide some way of explicating how the world may be in God. One such argument has recently been put forward by uh, Benedict Goeckel. He maintains that the only real distinction between theism and panentheism regards the modal status of the world. Modality has to do with possibilities and, necess and necessities. He writes this in his little quote. According to panentheism, the world is an intrinsic property of God, something that's part and parcel of who God is. Necessarily, there's a world. And according to classical theism, the world is an extrinsic property of God. It is only contingently true that there's a world. Therefore, as long as we do not have an argument showing that necessarily there is a world, panentheism is not an attractive alternative to classical theism. So, on Gerkel's view, it seems that the in in panentheism has to do with an intrinsic property of the divine nature, something in God himself, that entails 
that God necessarily creates the world, something not true of classical theism, he says. But there appear to be counterexamples to his claim, perhaps the most famous being one Jonathan Edwards, who you may have heard of. He aligned himself with classical theism, yet also maintained that God is essentially creative, such that he must create a world and must create this world. You'll hear more about that tomorrow. On Ed Edwards's view, God has an essential disposition to create, create, but if that's right, then the world is a necessary output of the divine nature. Well, it might be thought that whether Edwards held such a view or not, Gurkha's claim is about the internal logic of panentheism versus classical theism, which is an issue that's independent of the views of particular theologians. So, in other words, we might think, who cares what Edwards thinks? The issue is the issue. But the claim that God necessarily creates is not obviously inconsistent with classical theism. God may be the source of his action and act in a manner that is free, and yet act from an internal necessity of some kind, such as Edwards imagines with respect to God's moral necessity, as he calls it. Provided one can show that there's a distinction between how God in say, in himself, is logically independent of God's acts ad extra in the creation, one may, like Edwards, hold to a kind of theological compatibilism, the idea that God's freedom is compatible with his, his being determined, with, respo with respect to God's creative action in bringing about the world, and yet still be counted a classical theist of a sort. So there are problems with that option. A more promising attempt to provide some account of the N in panentheism is provided by the aforementioned Mullins, Ryan Mullins. He suggests that one way a panentheist could make sense uh, of the manner in which the world is said to exist in God is by making space and time divine attributes. Suppose with Mullins we distinguish between metaphysical space and time and physical space and time. Metaphysical time exists independent of any measurements we take of it and independent of the existence of any particular physical object. It's kind of ideal time. By contrast, physical space and time only exist if physical objects exist. We might say that physical space and time exist within metaphysical space and time. Given this distinction, says Mullins, and here's a quote from him, the panentheist would be saying that absolute space and time are to be construed as metaphysical space and time. These are divine attributes, whereas physical space and time are not. When God creates a universe, God creates <coughs> physical space and time. Physical space and time exist within metaphysical space and time. That is God. Now, it seems to me this is a better way of trying to get at the in of panentheism because it doesn't make a judgment about the necessity or contingency of the universe, as Gurkha does, and which is a matter that's in dispute in the literature on panentheism. Yet, as Mullins points out, on his view, the universe is literally in God because the universe is spatially and temporally located in God. The universe is located in space and time, and space and time are divine attributes. Here, the in of panentheism is not metaphorical, but metaphysical. Hence, unlike much of the literature on this topic, there is, a, there is real explanatory power to Mullins' proposal. However, as attractive as this strategy is, it's not without theological cost. Orthodox Christian panentheists, like Edwards, will balk at making space and time divine attributes because it entails that God is located and has extension. There are some recent philosophical proposals that suggest God is located at all points in space, yet on this way of thinking, God's presence is not so much circumscriptive as definitive, to borrow and repurpose a medieval distinction used in Eucharistic theology. That is, his presence is not such that he is distributed in a given area with certain parts in certain distinct places, like my body has a hand in one place and a foot in another, so that the body is distributed over a given area, which is a, a kind of circumscriptive presence. Instead, it may be that God's presence entails his being wholly at a place without being extended or distributed into parts that are at a distance or in different spatial regions from one another. 
In addition to this, Mullins' account requires that time is a divine attribute, thereby making God temporal. This too will be a difficult pill to swallow for those panentheists who are of a classical orthodox theological persuasion. For these reasons, it may be better to try and find another metaphysical way to make sense of the manner in which the world is said to exist in God. One promising way to construe the sort of panentheism that we're after, that is a panentheism consistent with uh, a broadly orthodox Christian theology, is as a mereological claim. In, in other words, that the created order is a part of God, because mereology has to do with parts and wholes. That is, God has a part that comprises the creation and a part that does not. This would give some metaphysical explanation of the phrase, the world is in God, used by panentheists, that would also demarcate it from theism and pantheism. From this construal of the term, the world is in God, in the sense that it exists as a part of God, though not the only part of God. This is clearly distinct from theism, since the theist claims that God and the world are not parts of one mirological whole. It's also distinct from pantheism because the pantheist claims either that God and the world are identical, so there's no non-trivial part-whole relation that applies to God and the world, or that the world composes God without remainder, which is more like the claim that God and the world are co-located or share all and only the same parts. Nevertheless, on the face of it, this mirological proposal is a, a very strange notion not least because it seems to require a very different conception of the divine from that held by the vast majority of historic Orthodox Christian thinkers for whom God is a being without composition. So then, let's spend a little bit of time thinking about this mirological view, this mirological panentheism. Let's get a clearer picture of this, this account. And to that end, I'm going to give you just a little metaphysical just-so story that expresses one but not the only way of thinking about the mirological account that will help us sort of see it more concretely and that borrows a number of key motifs from much recent theological discussion of panentheism. So here I'm trying to sort of echo some of that language, some of those concepts that one finds in the literature. Here's, here goes, here's the story. God creates from a necessity of his own nature. Though he's free in his action, his freedom is consistent with the fact that he must act according to his nature. He's the source of his free choices. Yet God is also essentially creative. It's part of his nature to be creative, such that the creation is the necessary output of divinity. God doesn't create a world outside of God's self. He doesn't bring about something entirely distinct from God's self. Rather, he somehow makes room within himself for the created order. The creation is radically dependent upon God for its existence, yet it's also the necessary output of the divine nature. God's not truly happy without the creation because it's, a means, it's by means of creation that he is able to express his love ad extra in a manner consistent with his essentially benevolent nature. Thus, creation is a part of God. There is God, and there is the world he creates, and these are two overlapping entities that together comprise one mirological whole that is God plus the world. So there's the story. Okay. Although this is a toy version of the mirological account, it shares much in common with a number of contemporary theologians who are said to be defenders of versions of panentheism. I'll give you a couple of examples, hopefully representative, that will make the point. So we've had the story. Here's how this reflects the literature. In The Trinity and the Kingdom, Jürgen Moltmann writes this, Christian panentheism started from the divine essence. Creation is a fruit of God's longing for his other and for that other's free response to the divine love. That is why the idea of the world is inherent in the nature of God himself from eternity, says Moltmann. And later on he goes on to say this, in order to create something outside himself, outside in, in, in scare quotes, the infinite God must have made room for his, this finitude beforehand in himself. This uh, leads on to his famous discussion of the notion of zimzum, that is, the divine contraction within God's self by means of which he makes an internal space in which the creation can come to be. 
I'm sure many of us remember the first time we heard of Zimzum in connection with Mormon. It is, on his way of thinking, literally inconceivable that God could fail to create in this manner. And he writes that it is impossible to conceive of a God who is not a creative God. Now, whatever else we think of Montmartre's discussion, it should be tolerably clear that his views entail that there is a God who is essentially creative and that the creation is somehow eternally contained within God. These two, God and the world he creates, are distinct parts of one mirological whole that comprise God plus the world, or at least that seems a plausible construal of what he's saying. Because God is by nature creative, the world he brings about is a kind of essential divine output without which his eternal love would find no adequate fulfillment. So that's one example, Moltmann. Here's a second example, Robert Jensen. Jensen takes a rather different view of this matter and would probably resist being called a panentheist. Nevertheless, he says something similar to Moltmann in connection with God's relation to the created order. And he writes this, for God to create is for him to make accommodation, similar language here, make accommodation in his triune life for other persons and things than the three whose mutual life he is. In himself, he opens room, and that act is the event of creation. Jensen even identifies roominess in connection with the creation as a divine attribute. There we go, roominess. <laughs> Write a dissertation on that. <laughs> Such enthusiasm for what Colin Gunton has called self-realization through the other, in connection with Jensen, strongly suggests that God somehow needs the world to be truly happy, a point not lost on Jensen's critics like George Hunsinger and Tom McCall. Like Moltmann, Jensen seems to think that God somehow requires the creation. His nature is so constituted that he's only truly happy when making room for the created other. But this means that God and creation are two parts of one symbiotic whole. Even though Jensen doesn't use mirological language as such, his views can plausibly be read as indicative of such a position. Now, the question is, does the mirological account or some version thereof, something like that, avoid the demarcation problem that we started with? Does it represent a stable theological alternative to bare theism on the one hand and pantheism on the other? If God and the world are two parts of a larger mirological whole, then the view is clearly distinct from bare theism. For recall, the bare theist is committed to the claim that God and the world are distinct, non-overlapping entities. The bare theist is also of the view that the world is contingent upon divine action, creation and conservation, whereas God is not dependent upon the world. Neither of these claims is consistent with mirological panentheism. So it seems that bare theism and mirological panentheism are distinct. What about the difference between mirological panentheism and pantheism? The pantheist thinks that the world is either identical to God, we saw, or composes God, like the marble composes the statue. Clearly, the mirological panentheist denies both of these claims. God and the world are not identical, and the world does not compose God, nor for that matter does God compose the world. Instead, God and the world are two overlapping parts of one mirological whole. Overlapping but not identical, overlapping but not uh, such that they, they share all and only the same members or parts. However, the defender of something like Mullins's account may raise an objection at this juncture. One of the merits of Mullins' proposal is that it prescinds from a judgment about whether or not the creation is the necessary output of the divine nature. This is an advantage because some versions of contemporary Christian panentheism, such as that offered by Philip Clayton, deny that God must create a world or that the world is something intrinsic to the divine nature. But the mirological account we, we sketched thus far, including the little just so story that I started off with, seems to require this. And certainly the versions of panentheism put forward by Moltmann and Jensen seem to do the same. And they've been cited here as paradigms of the sort of Christian panentheism that seems commensurate with the mirological account. So what to do? Well, in fact, we could adopt a mirological account that does not have this cost. Suppose God creates the world freely in the sense that although he's the source of his creative act, there is no necessity in the act of creation. God could have created some other world, and he could have refrained from creating any world. Suppose that's right. Given this way of thinking, 
it would still be true to say that the creation forms a part of the mirological whole, God plus the world. It's just that the world is a contingent part of the whole, not a necessary part. In a similar way, a prosthetic limb is a contingent part of the whole human amputee. But on one plausible way of thinking about such things, the instrumental union brought about by adding the prosthesis to the amputee generates a new mirological whole, that is, the amputee plus prosthesis. Though the union is a contingent one, the sum of the prosthesis and the amputee is nevertheless a mirological whole, or at least one could argue that. Thus it seems that there's a reason to think that the mirological panentheist can distinguish her view from both bare theists on the one hand and pantheists on the other. There is a metaphysical cost involved in doing so, of course, but provided one's willing to pay the price and embrace the view, it's possible to do so in the knowledge that mirological panentheism is distinct from these other two positions. So I'm, I'm arguing then that the mirological account can avoid the demarcation problem, which seems to be a besetting problem in the literature on panentheism. This brings us to our third section, problems, theological problems with the mirological account. Well then, what theological costs are involved in embracing mirological panentheism, and are they costs worth bearing? The most obvious theological problem for the mirological account, it seems to me, is that it implies that God is a part of a mirological sum, and this is contrary to the doctrine, doctrine of divine simplicity. This is indeed a concern for those enamored of classical versions of theism. However, our concern was not to provide some account of panentheism consistent with classical theism as such, but only with their broadly orthodox Christian theology. It's not clear to me that commitment to a broadly orthodox Christian theology implies or entails commitment to classical theism. For it seems to me that it's possible to be, say, a theistic personalist. In other words, think that God's a big person and hold to the tenets of a broadly orthodox Christian theology. Theistic personalism, which is very popular these days, is usually thought to be hostile to the traditional doctrine of divine simplicity. So perhaps one could be a theistic personalist of a broadly orthodox theological persuasion, there are a number of them around, and entertain the prospect of Christian panentheism understood according to some version of the mirological account. Perhaps that's possible. Another worry has to do with divine aseity. I take it that aseity is the claim that God is both metaphysically and psychologically independent of the created order. God is metaphysically independent of creation if it's possible for him to exist without the world. And God is psychologically independent of the created order if he does not need creatures in order to be happy or fulfilled or complete. However, if God and the world comprise a mirological sum, then doesn't this jeopardize divine aseity? Doesn't it mean that God needs the created order in some sense? He needs it metaphysically if the created order is the necessary output of the divine nature, and he needs it psychologically if he can only be fulfilled by creating a world. Well, as to the question of metaphysical aseity, I've already pointed out that even if the creation is the necessary output of the divine nature, provided God is logically prior to the created order, he is metaphysically independent of it. To illustrate this point, we may compare the discussion of God's relation to abstract objects by those who defend a mild version of Christian Platonism, according to which abstract objects like numbers are the eternal and necessary output of the divine nature. Even if one thinks that there are abstract objects, and that numbers are abstract objects, and that such, su such objects are eternally generated by the divine nature as something like epiphenomenal outputs of God, they kind of like come out of God like that, one may still maintain that God is logically prior to the abstract objects thus generated. The idea is that they are logically dependent on God for their existence, so they are eternal and necessary objects. Such a logical, determ such a logical de dependence doesn't necessarily imply a metaphysical dependence. In a similar way, God may be logically prior to the created order, though the creation is a necessary divine output. Let's turn to the question of psychological necessity. What can we say about that? Suppose God may create the world but may refrain from creating this world um, or any other world. Then even if he freely decides to create, thereby bringing about the world as a contingent kind of prosthesis to which he's related as a part to a whole, 
it doesn't appear to be psychologically dependent on such action. But what if with many contemporary panentheists we hold that God must create a world and that this world is the necessary output of the divine nature, something like the, the Jensonian or the Montmanian view? Here, too, there may still be some metaphysical wiggle room. It would be odd to think that by acting in accordance with his nature, God is psychologically dependent. Human beings are dependent rational animals. In thinking, humans are acting in accordance with their natures. Does that make them psychologically dependent upon the exercise of their rationality? Well, that would be a somewhat odd thing to say, it seems to me. And part of the reason it's odd has to do with the fact that human beings are inherently rational. They're by nature rational. So the dependency in question is a kind of ersatz or Pickwickian sense of dependency. In a similar fashion, the panentheist drawn to the notion that God must create a world according to some necessity of his nature is not thereby necessarily committed to saying God is psychologically dependent upon the created order of his happiness. For it may be that the divine creative action is simply the consequence of having the sort of nature God has, of being the sort of being that he is. However, there are other objections in the neighborhood of this one that do seem to tell against the mirological account. For it seems very difficult to see how one could hold to the ultimacy of God and subscribe to a version of the mirological view. I take it that the ultimacy of God is the view according to which all that exists other than God exists through God. There are no entities other than God that exist independently of God. It's a view to which I'm attracted. A closely related concern has to do with the sovereignty of God. If God is truly sovereign over creation, then there's nothing in creation that is independent of God's creative power. He is the source of all that exists. Can the defenders of the mirological account uphold divine ultimacy and sovereignty? It would appear that they cannot, and here's why. If God plus the world really is a mirological whole, then at least two significant theological consequences seem to follow. First, God plus the world seems to imperil divine ultimacy, for it makes the mirological sum of God and the world together something that seems to be greater than God without the world. In Hebrews 6.13, we are told that when God swore to Abraham, he swore by himself because there was nothing greater for him to swear by. Nothing more fundamental, and presumably nothing more excellent, than God's self. But on the mirological account, it looks like there is such a thing, namely the sum of God and the world. Second and closely related to this point, the mirological account seems to be inconsistent with perfect being theology. If God is a maximally perfect and maximally excellent being independent of the creation, then the mirological account appears to be in trouble. For on one way of construing the view, there is an axiological sense, in other words, a sense having to do with value, in which God's perfection is something less, in other words, something of less value, than the mirological sum of God and the world. And for those enamored of perfect being theology, this will be a serious concern. The final objection we will consider here, I shall call the incorporeality objection. According to the New Testament, God is a spirit, John 4, 24 tells us. I take it that spirits are essentially immaterial and incorporeal beings. But essentially incorporeal beings cannot, by definition, have bodies. Yet, on the mirological version of panentheism, God has a body, or at least God has a material part, namely the world. We can put this worry more formally in, in numbered propositions, for those who care for such things. It, this uh, reason comes in two parts. Here's the first part. Point one, God is a spirit, from John 4.24. Point two, spirits are essentially immaterial beings. Third, Immaterial beings lack location. Fourth, immaterial beings lack extension. Fifth, God is an essentially immaterial being. Now, at this juncture, we may raise a complication. This is the complication of the incarnation. Suppose that God is immaterial. Christ has a physical, apparently material, body. 
Does this imply that God the Son acquires location or extension on acquiring his physical body at the first moment of the Incarnation? No, it does not. The reason why it does not is that on any classical and orthodox Christology, in acquiring a human nature, God the Son does not acquire physical or material parts. Rather, he acquires the intimate relation, if he does acquire this even, he acquires the intimate relation of being hypostatically related to a particular human nature, the human nature of Jesus of Nazareth. But hypostatic or personal union with his human nature does not imply becoming physical or material, nor does it imply acquiring physical or material parts, any more than on a Cartesian way of thinking about human souls. It doesn't matter whether you don't like Cartesianism, just I'm taking that as an example. Any more than on a Cartesian way of thinking about human souls, in acquiring a resurrected body, a human soul acquires physical parts. Okay, so that's the first part of the argument that leads us um, from the claim that God is spirit to the claim that God is essentially an essentially material being. Here's the second part. The world is a material being. This is point six. Material beings are located. Point seven. Point eight, material beings are normally extended in space. And point nine, God is not a material being. It seems to me that this reasoning is valid. Is it sound? Well, it seems to me that it is, provided one thinks that the physical world is composed of matter. Not all Christian theologians have thought this is the case, however. Bishop George Barclay and Jonathan Edwards are two of the most celebrated examples of this. They were immaterialists. That is, they denied that the physical world was a world composed of matter. Instead, they proposed that the physical world is composed of ideas and percepts that are communicated to minds. In which case, one way to avoid the bind of the incorporeality objection is to adopt immaterialism. And in fact, there are the beginnings of a renewed interest in, in immaterialism and I idealism more generally amongst Christian philosophers. If the defender of mere, if the, I'm not an immaterialist, by the way, I think it's a mad idea, but there we go. <laughs> if the defender of the mirological account of Christian panentheism were to do that, then God may have the world as a body, but because the body in question is not a material object, but a collection of created minds and their ideas, in creating the world, God is not embodied. In other words, he doesn't acquire a material part because there's no such thing as matter. Right, so the problem dissolves. However, for those unwilling to adopt immaterialism, it seems that the incorporeality objection does provide a serious conceptual problem for the defender of a theistic and more specifically Christian version of mirological panentheism. I come to my conclusion, the theistic alternative. We've seen that one way to characterize versions of panentheism consistent with a broadly orthodox Christian theology that avoids the demarcation problem is the mirological account. Nevertheless, this has significant theological costs. It's inconsistent with the divine simplicity. It's inconsistent with the divine ultimacy and sovereignty. And it can only meet the incorporeality objection by way of embracing immaterialism which is unlikely to appeal to many Christian theologians not sympathetic to idealism. In principle, theism suffers from none of these drawbacks. The theist, and the Christian theist in particular, has no demarcation problem to address. It does not require that God's relation to the world is analogous to a kind of part-whole relation. It is able to affirm a doctrine of divine simplicity given a particular construal of theism, and is consistent with divine ultimacy and sovereignty, again, given a particular construal of theism. Thus, there seem to be important theological reasons in favor of retaining theism and rejecting the sort of mirological account of panentheism we've been considering. Thank you. <laughs>
your, what do you think is the root attraction to pan-Atheism in so much modern theology? Um, I think it de rather depends on the version of panentheism that you're talking about. So I think, for example, um, in the religion and science literature, there's a real concern about things like divine transcendence and divine intervention in a causally cl closed universe. And so a number of people working in that area who um, think about the doctrine of God are attracted to panentheism because they think it solves certain sorts of problems of that nature. You know, you don't have to worry too much about an entity that's completely other than us, completely transcendent, if you adopt some version of panentheism because he's locked into, he's not just locked into, he's, he's caught up with the life of the world. Um, and uh, similarly with the, um, with the other problems. So I think if you, if you take the, the religion science literature, people like Philip Clayton or Ian Barber, those sorts of people um, are um, trying to think about those things with those issues in mind. Um, when it comes to people like Moltmann and Jensen and others, I think perhaps there might be slightly different motivations. I mean, in part, with, I mean, uh, Pannenberg is another person who falls into this bracket, I suppose. In part, I suppose, uh, you might think of those three very important theologians as part of a post bartian trajectory in modern theology, uh, who share in common a, n a number of similar ideas about both God's relationship to the world and God's relationship to the future. You know, the idea that somehow God's future is coming to him and constitutes his present, as, as uh, some of those thinkers say, and so on. Um, or the ontological priority of the future, as Pannenberg puts it, right? Um, and so it might be that for thinkers of that ilk, there are certain advantages to panentheism um, having to do with their broader theological project, the broader project that, that falls into this kind of stream of post bartian theology, um, where thinking of God's relationship to the world is this much more intimate way of um, being connected, um, helps them to make sense of all sorts of um, theological problems on the ground now, things like the problem of evil, and then uh, the, the future as, as well, in terms of how God constitutes himself in the future, or is constituted by his future, or whatever the language is. Um, and then perhaps there's, I mean, there are all sorts, of, the part of the problem here, as I'm trying to indicate, is there's lots and lots of different versions of panentheism. Uh, and um, it's just very difficult to give a, a simple answer to that question when it seems like there, there are different sorts of motivations. In the philosophical literature, for example, um, I'm not quite sure. I suppose it might be that the philosophers are sympathetic to a kind of Neoplatonic way of thinking about God's relationship to the creation, perhaps. Maybe that's a motivation. But it's complicated. I don't know if that's much of an answer. Derek. Um, I just uh, kind of piggybacking on that, I, I guess what I'm wondering is how, what advantage over just a sufficiently <coughs> robust and kind of omnipresence? Yeah, good. And kind of is supposed to give us, like, what advantage is supposed to give us in terms of, like, the God world relationship in terms of, you know, science and creation days, you know, science and, and uh, uh, divine action days, given a fairly robust and kind of omnipresent. But very close to, to to every molecule in reality. I mean, which I'm, so I'm wondering, I guess at that point, what advantage would you, but then also how does it then possibly be as um, draw a very clear line between uh, the possible kind of presence and something that starts shading into all the intent of Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think there's an interesting. Uh, maybe there's an interesting paper to be written on that topic. In fact, I, th I started out thinking that was going to be the paper I gave you today, but it went in a slightly different direction. Um, so on the question of uh, what distinguishes omnipresence from panentheism, it rather depends on the version of omniscience that you have in mind. But So let me say something general and then something specific. So I'll, this is the general point. I suppose um, for the panentheist, 
a doctrine of omnis omnipresence, however that's construed, is not sufficient. Right? It might be a necessary condition for their, depending on the panentheist, for their panentheism, but it's not enough. It doesn't get you enough. Because what you want is, in addition to God being present everywhere, you want some, uh, some account of how it is that God is, you know, kind of intimately enmeshed with or integrated into or bound up with the created order. Uh, and you don't necessarily get that on sort of a traditional account of omniscience. So there's, there's a kind of value added in bringing in the panenth panentheist way of thinking. So that's the general point. The specific point then is this. Um, as I tried to in very briefly indicate in the paper, there is a, there's a recent literature on um, omniscience amongst um, the analytic community, um, some of whom want to defend what we might think of as a, a sort of textbook version of uh, omnipresence, um, where God is not uh, located anywhere, but he's somehow present with each point in creation, something like the Anselmian, the traditional sort of Anselmian view, or at least the traditional way that Anselm's understood by many people. So Joseph Jedwab, for example, has recently defended that view. He calls it kind of like a metaphorical account because, uh, strictly speaking, God isn't literally located at every point in space-time. Um, but an alternative way of thinking would be to suggest uh, that there is some sense in which God is um, located at every point, but not in such a way that, that means he's got part, a part here and a part there and a part over there, but in some sense in which he's wholly present, which is why I was using this kind of medieval Eucharistic language to try and uh, motivate uh, that claim. And that, that's been really interestingly developed by Hud Hudson, for example, um, and Alex Proust in a recent article in the uh, Journal of Analytic Theology, and then Ross Inman, um, who teaches at one of the Southern seminaries, Southern Baptist seminaries, um, has got an article coming out, which I think is really interesting on this stuff. It's coming out in the Oxford Studies in Philosophy of Religion series. It's really interesting because he wants to claim that this sort of a view, uh, the view that I've just described, um, is actually commensurate with much of the tradition and is really the view that, uh, you know, the medievals thought was the default option. Is actually moderns who've reinterpreted omnipresence in a way that doesn't include location. So that's kind of an interesting kind of revisionist paper. So um, uh, I look forward to seeing that when it comes out. Um, so that, that's the more specific point. As you can see, there are, you know, several live issues in the current debate on, on this that would give you different answers for the panentheist, depending on which of those you went for. Does that help? Thanks for being here, Oliver. Good paper. Thank you for having me. This topic, we need some clarity. <coughs> so, on that score of needing clarity, <laughs> how would you draw this as a Venn diagram? You know, the part whole. The yeah, picture. yeah. I, I often picture it as a big circle and a little circle within it. Yeah. You call the little circle the womb. Right. With that maternal, well, many panentheists are feminists. The yeah. Right. 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 Really yeah. Concerned about what yeah. you think about yeah. the relationship. So, what about <coughs> the uh, mother to womb to fetus model, uh, thinking of the term, is that a part whole? Because the yeah, is yeah, good. who she is without the infant, and yet there's this fetus alive inside. In that, what about the maternal, or what's the proper word, the, the womb like in? Uh, yeah. Is that a part whole? Yeah, I think it, I, at least you could construe it that way, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, um, th that section where I did a little bit of Maltman, a little bit of Jen I mean, you could just multiply all the examples. You know, I, I nearly did a little bit of, brought a little bit of Pannenberg in, but I was like, well, this paper is getting too long anyway, right? People have got to suffer through it. Um, uh, but yes, I think you're absolutely right. There are other um, panentheistic literatures, like the feminist literature, where at least some of those people writing the topic say things that could be construed that way. Now, I'm trying to be careful how I um, phrase what I'm saying here, simply because, um, as I've indicated in the paper, a lot of the panentheistic literature punts to metaphor at the crucial point at which you want them to say, what does the in relation really mean, right? So, so I suppose some of the feminists might say, no, this is just a metaphor. 
the part you're construing the, the womb image as a uh, as a part whole relation, but we're not committed to that being metaphysically the case. We're only committed to that being um, somehow illustrative of something fundamental about the divine nature that maybe we can't articulate, we can't get at, we don't have a clear conceptual grip on something like that. I, I suppose they could go that route, right? And then they would avoid the uh, the um, implication of the part whole. But um, Maybe some of them would, would say, yeah, that's exactly what we mean. It's, we mean it's something like a part of a relationship. And here's an illustration. The boom is an illustration. So it depends on. So back to the Venn diagram, how, yeah. would you, how would you draw the part whole relationship? You mean with respect to panentheism? Yeah. In your mirror logic. Yeah, I think, I think you've got it. I mean, it's something like a, a, a circle contained within a larger circle. Yeah. Um, Jeff, did you have a question? No? Yes. Uh, is divine it's the dean. Is the part of the attraction of pantheism? That... Yes, I think absolutely. I mean, certainly for people like Moltmann, um, very much so. Of course, it's caught up with this theopashite um, Christology, right? The reason why I quote from Trinity in the Kingdom is, is because it's a kind of programmatic statement of much of his work. Um, but you can find these views dotted throughout his corpus, I think. Um, and I think for many contemporary systematicians who are attracted to panentheism, a motivation for that is precisely that they uh, have, a, have kind of um, what we might call revisionist sensibilities when it comes to the doctrine of God. You know, God must be a person. Uh, God must, it can't be simple in the, in the Thomistic sense. It can't be pure act. Uh, God must, if he truly loves us, this is, of course, Malt, one of Maltman's big um, issues. If he really loves us, he must be able to um, not just sympathize with us, but empathize with us, feel our pain so he can't be impassable, and so on and so forth. So you end up with um, this as being part and parcel of a broader program in the doctrine of God that involves revisiting a lot of these kind of classical tenets of the, of, the, of the doctrine of God and um, making significant adjustments along the way. So yes, I would say. But if I may add one further point, I mean, you might, l suppose you look back in time at various historic theologians, I did less of this in this paper, of course, uh, historic theologians who are claimed to be panentheists. Of course, panentheism as a term is, you know, post-dates them. It's kind of an acronym to claim that Jonathan Edwards is a panentheist since he doesn't know what a panentheist is. It's not a term that he uses. Um, but I suppose if you look back in time and you look back at a number of historic theologians who are claimed, who are often claimed to be panentheists by people like John Cooper and others, um, it's not clear that in every case their motivation, if they are panentheists, is a kind of revisionist program that includes some notion of divine possibility. So I think there's a difference in historic literature between the historic literature, as it were, and um, the contemporary literature. Yeah. Stephen. Yes, can I follow this on up? Um, many thanks, by the way, for the um, lectures. I much appreciate it. I'm, I'm official um, that divine possibility is such that all people in the direction of pantheism is positive or not. In fact, as an independent fact, it's hard to see how to do that. <clears throat> I'm thinking of those who would be strong Catholic here. In all, in all respects, yeah. say that of impassibility. Uh, right. In Pariyo, in the old days, for example. Yeah, yeah. Resident Catholic here yeah. returned to an impassibility position, actually. But one thing said, this is the one point at which Catholic here is yeah. maybe revised. Yeah. Uh, something like Don McLeod. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, yeah. But definitely not panentheism. Yes. It's interesting to know why possibility would, of itself, tell anyone toward panentheism. Well, it deliberately that. Yeah, good. Argument yeah, no, that's no, good. It's good. So, um, I'm not sure that if the only concern was whether God is passable or not, that that question in and of itself is going to drive you to panentheism. But, and as you've just given examples of people who worried about that but weren't or haven't been driven in that direction, 
it looks like there are good examples of people who can say, well, look, here's someone who was a past, that does feel the kind of gravitational pull to divine possibility, but hasn't gone and revised lots of other things in their doctrine of God. Um, so you might have a kind of localized revisionism, if you like. Just this, just this particular tenet of the classical account seems problematic, and I can't go with that. The rest of it I can buy. OK, that's fine. Um, I suppose that people like Moltmann, though, to take him as a, as a famous example of a systematician who's a panentheist, um, hasn't just got a problem with that one aspect of the classical account of God, but has got a problem with the whole of the classical account of God. You know, he, he thinks the whole thing has got to be significantly revised, and perhaps um, the question of possibility is the, um, the, the key that unlocks that door or something like that. I'm just thinking about his, the, uh, his in particular, theological trajectory in terms of, you know, the crucified God and, and where that takes him. Um, so I agree with you that, in principle, worrying about impossibility doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up as a panentheist. I'm not even clear that it's a slippery slope. Um, but it certainly, there certainly seems some evidence in, in the kind of modern theological canon of those who use that as a one, maybe even one important constituent of a revisionist program that concludes with panentheism, something like that. Yeah. Yes? Is it possible to characterize the relationship between this question, theism versus panentheism, and the question of creation being ex nihilo? Yes. Because all of this talk about God creating space within God's fall. Yeah, yeah. Creation, or, or from another angle, time and space as attributes of God raises to my mind the question of creation ex nihilo. Yeah. And I know that you, people do hold the position of theism and also deny creation ex nihilo, so it's right. not a, Right. Necessarily a sharp relationship, but I'm wondering if it's possible to characterize how those categories relate. Yeah, so this is obviously an important and closely related topic that I didn't have the space to tackle. I mean, a bit like the topic of transcendence is a really important topic, or divine simplicity is a really important topic that bears on this, but neither of those topics that I have space to, to really get into. But um, yes, I think you're right. The complicating factor here is I, it's not to me that your stance on creation out of uh, on creation ex nihilo out of nothing um, determines whether you're you know fall into the panentheist or the theist camp or re even the pantheist camp perhaps um, because you can you can point to good examples of of theologians who fall clearly within the theistic paradigm who are who wholeheartedly endorse creation creation out of nothing as well as those who fall within the panentheist camp who endorse creation out of nothing. So it doesn't look like it's a, that particular doctrine is, is salient with respect to distinguishing one view, you know, the de demarcation problem, as it were, right? If, we, if we're asking the question, what demarcates, uh, if we've got this taxonomy of three views, theism, panentheism, and uh, pantheism, if we're asking what demarcates theism from panentheism, creation ex nihilo is not going to be one of those things, um, simply because the intramural discussions of, amongst theists and amongst panentheists include people who say yes for creation out of nothing, no for creation out of nothing, yes for creation out of nothing, no, and so on, right? So that's what I'd say to that. Yeah. Kevin again. Yeah. Okay. No. I'm hoping that he's oh. going to be able to write a postcard to my friend Philip Clayton. Yes. Four or five points, you know, yeah. casting this Oh my goodness, no. Universe forever. Yeah. <laughs> but am I right in thinking that your argument against panentheism is an external critique? In other words, this is what theists should rightly say. Yeah. Because this is what we're. But but a panentheist would probably not be moved by. That. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Uh, also, I mean, I. I mean, maybe we well, we all do this. I don't know. I certainly often start papers or start books with this kind of like, I am going to write the paper that destroys whatever it is, or, or the paper that promotes whatever it is. Yeah, and of course, yeah, well, right. <laughs> <laughs> and you, I end up kind of narrowing it down, narrowing it down. So I ended up just saying, well, look, um, you know, maybe a more manageable issue is this issue of whether um, one can adopt a version of 
panentheism that's consistent with broadly um, orthodox Christian theological commitments. That seems to me to be the, the kind of version of panentheism that's relevant to me, and I guess most people in the room. I mean, in a sense, the other sorts of panentheism are interesting, conceptually interesting, and worth thinking about, but they don't impact me existentially in the same way, right? So someone who's a, a naturalist and a panentheist, well, knock yourself out. <laughs> it doesn't move me as a Christian. Um, and I suppose, I suppose a panentheist, if a panentheist were to listen to this paper or read this paper, they might say, well, bully for you. That's great. I'm going to keep my panentheism. I think one of the things they object to is the picture of God in classical theism as yeah. remote, removed, uncaring, yeah. basically unrelated to the world. Yeah. So I'm still looking for an argument that would, but I, I, I have thought maybe the argument that needs to be done with Christians is arguing for scripture. Yeah. The rich model of theism can better accounts for what we see of God depicted in scripture. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to think that the biblical record is kind of metaphysically underdetermined in this respect. And it, I hope this is not too naughty for me to say this, Kevin, but in 1999, in a dialogue response to Philip Clayton, you kind of said something similar. So um, that, my, my sense is just that, that, you know, you, you can, I mean, you can pull out, I mean, of course, like the, uh, the, 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 the Acts text, you know, in him we live, move, and have our being, is, is, is always pulled out of, of the hat by the panentheist. Um, I mean, maybe there are other texts they could, could point to and sort of say, at least this is not inconsistent with my view, or uh, maybe it's even commensurate with my view. It doesn't entail my view. <laughs> Sam And you no longer hold that view. Okay, well, fair enough. Yeah. Please allow a second door. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, why not? Why not? Any other sort of not asked questions? I'd like to follow up. I think. Sorry. Yeah. The biblical account of God in Scripture has to be looked at very carefully here. Yeah. Including God's spirit. Yes. Because I think for many of us, we come to it in the God's interior. Right. What is the basis of supposing the spirit you are you are your God is Sure. I don't have anything terribly interesting to say about that since I don't work in biblical studies. Um, but I agree with you that that is an important matter and it would be helpful to, you know, have some input from biblical studies on that point. Yeah. That would be really good. Yes, Joel. So this gets at uh, some of your talk at AAR last year, too. What do you see the role of Scripture being in uh, philosophical theology? So yeah. I, I get that um, you want to carve out room for multiple metaphysics, multiple epistemologies, as all being consonant with the biblical witness. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to that. Yeah. Can we say anything more that perhaps... Yeah, I think yeah, of course we can. I, I don't want to, and I think I might have said this in the fall, uh, uh, I, I don't want to suggest that Scripture is a wax nose or something like that, um, that we can mold into any shape we want. I'm not saying that. Um, but I do think there are certain issues on which it's not clear to me that the evidence just simply falls on, you know, is, is in, yields or, or implies a particular philosophical view, right? Um, uh, but, uh, of course, we want to build a biblical uh, case for whatever theological view it is that we're thinking about um, to the extent that Scripture speaks about whatever it is the, the theological issue is that we're dealing with. Um, and I think that's very important. If you're asking me what role do I think Scripture plays in making theological judgments, I would say a fundamental role. I think it's the norming norm that norms all other norms, and I'm on record as saying that, so it's not... It's not like I'm pulling that out of my hat. Um, now, Scripture doesn't, I mean, in, in many 
philosophical discussions, philosophical theological discussions. Scripture, you know, you don't have long, long at least in contemporary philosophical theology, you don't tend to have so many long philosophical uh, disquisitions on the nature of Scripture. Um, but I think that too is beginning to change. I mean, you are seeing a, uh, an interest amongst philosophical theologians in engaging the biblical traditions and in interfacing with um, biblical studies. I think that of the work at the Logos Institute at St. Andrews is a, a good case of that. I mean, one of the things I find very exciting about that project is precisely that you have um, scholars from two different sub-disciplines that have usually ignored one another really beginning to try to engage one another and listen, hopefully, to one another. That takes time, though. It doesn't happen overnight because there's so much suspicion between guilds. Um, but I, I'm hopeful that there's, there's the beginnings of, of use of work being done on that score uh, in places like uh, Logos. And I think also there is some evidence that philosophical theologians are waking up to the fact that um, in, certainly in the analytic tradition, in any, in any case, that um, there's only so much they can do, right? That there's a limitation to what the um, philosophical toolkit is able to bring to the table, so to speak. Um, and there I th think of, well, a, a good example of that is, say, um, Eleanor Stump's book, Wandering in Darkness, where she talks about the importance of narrative and um, uh, not as kind of something decorative, but something really important that um, we need to take very seriously. And of course, uh, narrative as it, as it pertains to the biblical text, and she spends a lot of time, for example, in Job. Um, and more recently, Mike Ray has been doing some work similarly on, on the biblical texts um, in his stuff on divine hiddenness, and really trying to, I think, really trying to grapple with um, how we think about divine hiddenness um, as it arises in the biblical material and how that might inform our philosophical arguments about these things, right? In, in thick ways, not just proof texting, but in thick ways. So um, I would say uh, there's work to be done on that score in the analytic theological guild, if there is such a thing. Um, but I do think that the analytic theologians are, are listening and trying to begin to address that. But I, and I think you're, you're absolutely right to raise it because I think it's a really important issue. Yeah. John. What would you say to someone who asked, um, <coughs> given the orthodox evangelical views on divine omnipresence and also God's uh, preservation of everything, Mm. When you put those two things together, what's really the difference between that and panentheism? Um, well, so this uh, plays off the earlier point about uh, from Derek about what's the value added beyond omnipresence. I suppose you're saying what's the value added in panentheism beyond omnipresence and conservation or something like that. Or, or perhaps what's the value added in uh, panentheism if you've already got a robust sort of orthodox account of, of um, om omnipresence and d divine way, providence or something. Yeah, another way to put it is if you believe in <coughs> omnipresence and divine preservation of every sort of liquid molecule that you yeah. see, yeah, yeah. Uh, doesn't that amount to basically what uh, panentheism amounts to, even if metaphysically there's some difference there? So then, are, are the panentheists really that far off? Well, so this gets, uh, so maybe there are several things I can say that, uh, uh, that sounds like you're coming back to the demarcation problem, you know, is there really a difference between the panentheist and the theist, um, which is where we started. I've tried to argue that I think there is a difference given certain, a certain way of construing panentheism given the fact that there's like a zillion ways of thinking about panentheism, um, and uh, given a broadly uh, orthodox account of theism. Um, mine, the, the way I've tried to demarcate it is not the only way on offer. I mean, uh, I gave two other examples, and I think, I think um, they're both interesting ways of going. But if the issue is more, suppose you're an orthodox, a broadly orthodox Christian, right? So you've got a broadly orthodox, broadly orthodox account of divine 
presence and divine governance, what more do you need? Well, that's a good question. I mean, that's why I'm not. A, that's one of the reasons why I'm not a panentheist, because I'm like, well, I've got a good enough account of divine presence and divine governance. I don't need to go any further down that road. Yeah. Now, I, I agree with your demarcation of, of the <coughs> issue. Uh, I'm just thinking from a practical standpoint of someone who perhaps is a novice in this area, but not totally a novice, hearing what we're saying ontologically or metaphysically and yeah. not seeing any particular difference and um, practical difference in terms of our sense of nearness to God oh, yeah. and availability. Yeah. And in both cases, um, both are going to say, well, this nearness makes him much more accessible, more relational. Uh, then it, it strikes me that someone who is perhaps a lay person, even a Formed lay person or even an academic might say, I don't really see uh, a cash value difference between the orthodox position and panentheism when you see what they amount to. That may be, that may be the case. I mean, I, I suppose there are all sorts of situations in life where you can get the same net result, practically speaking, though the result in two cases is brought about by you know, two very different sorts of action or motivations or something like that. Um, you know, the person who's kind to the young person because they care about the young person will demonstrate kindness. The person who's kind to the young person because, um, you know, they have some nefarious purposes in mind for the young person will also demonstrate kindness. The same action, practically speaking, but we like one motivation and hopefully we strongly dislike the other one for good reasons, right, for good moral reasons. Um, so you, I suppose similarly here you might think, well, look, um, what's the cash value, so to speak, or what's the practical outworking of these highfalutin ideas? Um, it, you know, isn't it the case that um, someone who's a panentheist is going to pretty much, in practical terms, do some, you know, have have uh, or live their lives in a way similar to the Christian? Maybe, not necessarily. Depends on the version of the panentheism, right? I mean, given the fact that there are versions of panentheism that are not in any way consistent with Orthodox Christian belief. Presumably, panentheists who adopt that kind of view might well end up doing something practically very different from the Christian. But for someone who's a Christian and who holds to an Orthodox account of omnipresence and divine governance, if the question is, well, I've got these views, they kind of work for, for me and I find them in scripture, why would I want to be a panentheist? I'd say, don't be a panentheist. <laughs> <laughs> and, and part of the motivation behind my question was to note that uh, I think it is important for us to teach both lay people and academics that these doctrines do make a difference. Yeah. Uh, even though they may sound like they come out to be the same thing, there is a difference. I think you're absolutely right. And I, I'm uh, totally committed to trying to um, bring what we discuss in the academy into a form that people can find accessible. If we're not doing that, then we really are academics in the pejorative sense of the term, it seems to me. Yeah. Yeah, I, apparently it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the new thing. So it strikes me that the root difference is whether creation adds something to God. Yeah. In other words, whether God plus the world adds up to something more than just God. Yeah. And if that's the key difference, then I wonder if the demarcation is strongest between panentheism and classical theism, mm. whereas sort of the mere theism you describe, or a theistic personalism, yeah. it seems to me that God plus the world is more than God, though they wouldn't self-identify as panentheists. Whereas mm. classical theism, where God is pure act, there's a sense in which God creating the world isn't actualizing a formerly unactualized potency. It's, it's in yeah. a sense a, a new modality of something which already obtains eternally within the fullness of the divine life. And so I guess I'm mm. to bring that to a more concrete pointed question. Perhaps there's a there's a quality of difference between classical theism and panentheism, but not between mere theism and panentheism. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the reason I went for bare theism, as I call it, or mere theism, whatever you want to call it, rather than classical theism, is because I wanted to I wanted to be as expansive and generous in my orthodoxy as possible. Right? I want to say, well, there's this group of people over here. Some of them are classical theists. Some of them are theistic personalists. 
But we're all theists. That's the important thing. And that makes us different from panentheists. So that's, I made a deliberate choice there not to be more specific in order to be more inclusive with respect to that group of people. But your question is, um, maybe, I sh maybe I should have been more discriminating. Well, I guess I'm groping for where the real difference is between a mere theist well, and a panentheist. I can see if there's a clear difference between a classical theist and a panentheist based on your argument. Yeah, I mean, um, I think there are significant differences between mere theism and panentheism, I, as I uh, tried to indicate in the paper. I mean, for one thing, the mere theist is committed, like all theists, um, to the notion that God and the world are distinct, right? Um, that the world is not part of a mirological sum with God. Um, so they're going to deny that central claim that I've said is important in the version of panentheism that I was trying to <coughs> I was trying to outline. Um, now. You might think, well, if you had the richer classical account, then you'd have all sorts of additional resources, theological resources, with which to fortify your theism that would present a much more robust case against the panentheist. Maybe that's true. I don't know. I mean, I'm not a theistic personalist, but I know plenty of people who are theistic personalists, and I think you can provide rich and theologically sophisticated versions of theistic personalism uh, that are pretty staunchly non-panentheist in nature, or even anti-panentheist in some respects. I don't want to belabor the point, but doesn't a theistic personalist think that God and the world do form a whole that didn't attain? Why would they think that? Well, if God has, is characterized by having potencies, and now he's actualized one, and so now we have God plus something that wasn't there before, it sounds like we have a whole that's constituted by two parts. We don't call that a whole God. Well, it depends what you mean by potencies. I mean, that's why I'm trying to be careful. I mean, I, I suppose that might be the case for some theistic personalists. But suppose um, you're a theistic personalist who's not quite ready to give up on all of the um, tenets of a classical account, right? So suppose you, you think that God um, is a person writ large in some sense, or a community of persons writ large, uh, that we can have some univocal access to. So that already that's distinguishing the theistic personalism from the classical view. Um, but you think that this community of persons um, exists atemporally or something like that. Then any potency that God has in bringing about the created order is not going to be a potency that takes time for God to actualize. It's, a, it's going to be something to do with, presumably, the eternal act by means of which God brings about the world from nothing or something like that. Well then, yeah, you can talk about potency of a kind of ersatz sort, but it doesn't have the same sort of purchase, I don't think. Or at least it doesn't raise those worries in quite the same form, it seems to me. The Dean. Uh, thank you. I've uh, really enjoyed this. Um, can you do metaphysics without metaphors? Well. Uh, do you have a set of metaphors for your position? Because uh, you take some other people's set of metaphors. Yeah. Of yeah. No the, well, there are different views on this, of course. As in any interesting literature, there are always going to be different views. Um, if you're asking me, do I? like using metaphors. Uh, in my work, I suppose I would say I try not to use metaphors. I mean, I think it's impossible not to use metaphors in, in one's thinking. But I try not to use metaphors to bear much structural weight in the theological arguments that I provide, precisely because I think they're um, sort of tricky things, I suppose. Um, so. I tried to use metaphors or pictures to illustrate the doctrines or the models that I'm trying to elaborate, um, but not to uh, bear the weight of those doctrines or models. Does that help? You don't look particularly thrilled with that response. <laughs> well, I did say that you can't escape metaphor entirely. <coughs> What's that, sorry? Well, I've seen accounts of the Trinity that draw on the um, 
a logic of relations. Yeah. You know, yeah. X brackets. Uh, yeah, sure. Y, yeah. And uh, is that where you're going to go with it? I mean, one could formalize an argument in that way. I try not to do that in my work. I've, t I've made a decision not to do that in my work uh, because I want to try and write in such a way that um, hopefully the work is more accessible to a broader range of people who find that kind of thing off-putting. But I think that's a slightly different point from the metaphor point, maybe. I'm sure, I'm sure that's true, yeah. absolutely, yeah. I think that's absolutely right. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that our theology ought to be full of metaphor necessarily, right? Depending on what you think the role of theology is. Um, it seems to me that theology is about trying to um, articulate doctrine and trying to provide models for understanding particular theological claims, things like that. Uh, and the pursuit of a certain kind of rigor in order to uh, in, in order to get to that end. And so that's different from what scripture's trying to do for us. <coughs> well, thank you so very much, Dr. Chris, for the lecture and the interaction with us. This has been fantastic. And We've all been blessed and stimulated, and uh, just great to have you here Thank you. this afternoon.